Lisa and I had just celebrated our 20th anniversary with our two daughters Jasmine, 16, Casey, 13, and our 15-year-old son Jake. My name is Joel, a 42-year-old happy dad and husband at the time of this incident. At least I was a happy husband until I wasn't. When we married, Lisa had just turned 20 and I was her first and only love. I was two years older and had a few other girlfriends before we married. She was a pretty young woman, 5 feet 6 inches, blonde hair, blue eyes, all in a cute 105-pound package. We had an amazing marriage and enjoyed struggling to give our kids a good home and happy environment. For the past 20 years, we spent all of our time together and did everything as a family. The happy times, birthdays, first days of school, plays, graduations. Even the bad times brought us closer together. There were Jake's broken bones from football, twisted ankles, stitches from girls' soccer accidents, and even Lisa's cancer scare. I remember spending all those months taking her to the hospital, staying with her during her chemo and blood transfusions, taking care of the kids, and trying to keep everything together. Her recovery seven years ago brought the family even closer, and we celebrated the blessing that Lisa beat cancer, and we were still a strong family. As you can imagine, raising three kids, paying all the bills, and trying to save for college tuition was stressful. The first thing to go is your trips to the gym and worrying about your diet or looks. Over 20 years, you can easily put on a pound or two each and every year, but neither of us cared about that as we were both more focused on saving for our children's future. I worked as a production manager for an engineering company and Lisa was the purchasing director for a mid-size manufacturing company. We both worked hard but were always there for the children. Even though our lives became redundant and routine, our love and intimacy never lacked, and we always found time for sex and making sure we were both happy in bed. We weren't sexual deviants but more plain vanilla than some of the stories we've read together, but we both seemed to be happy and satisfied with our lovemaking and relationship. For years earlier, we got some new neighbors, Maria and Roger. They were in their late 20s, had no kids, and liked to have weekend parties. Maria was a gym instructor with an amazing body. Roger was 30 and also in good shape, as you would expect from a young man married to a beautiful woman like Maria. When Lisa turned 38, she was about 35 pounds overweight, which never bothered me in the least as I also had about 20 extra pounds from our years of working hard without time to work out or take care of myself. Maria convinced Lisa that she was a beautiful woman and could easily lose the extra weight if she started going to the gym with her. Two years later, just before Lisa was about to turn 40, Lisa was down to 110 pounds with the body of her 20 years past. She looked amazing and I always complimented her on how beautiful she was. Lisa became a new person, more confident and sexual. Our sex life had improved with her new level of energy. Lisa had rediscovered her youth and I tried to keep up and make her happy. Of course, along with the new body came the new clothes and an updated fashion sense. With her new friend Maria's help, Lisa was now wearing more revealing sexy clothes. The new Lisa was enjoying her new body and liked to show it off in the tighter, more revealing fashionable outfits. At first, I was a little concerned as she went off to work looking like a sexy young woman as I spent my day in my dad's body and old suits. When we were out together, I now looked more like her father than I did her partner or husband. She always tried to make me feel important saying that looks didn't matter because I was the same man she loved for the last 20 years and will have the same love for me over the next 20. The difference was that I'll now get to enjoy a sexy wife instead of the overweight woman I'd lived with. I told her that I loved that woman either way and her looks didn't matter. For her 40th birthday, I'd arranged a big party and invited all of our friends and workmates. I rented a small hall at the local hotel with a band and fully catered the party with an open bar. Lisa wore the sexiest little dress and new heels and after a day at the salon, she looked like a supermodel. I watched the men eyeing her and I could tell she loved the attention. Her new level of confidence was obvious and she became more outward and a free spirit, not the 40-year-old mother I was used to. It was a great party and she made sure to thank Maria for helping her get her youth back and how all the work helped her become who she was and how it helped her marriage. I had to admit I loved looking at her new body and her new sexy attitude. What I didn't like was watching her slow dance and flirt with several young men from her office. Over all the years of marriage, she never danced with other men or openly flirted, but now she seemed to enjoy the attention. 
This troubled me, but I let her enjoy her party and would discuss my feelings later. When I mentioned it that night after the party, she apologized and explained that she never wanted me to feel jealous or awkward and that she would never do that again. She explained that she just got carried away from all the excitement and drinks. That night she made up for it in bed and even gave me a wonderful BJ which was a rare gift. She was a tigress in bed that night and she enjoyed multiple orgasms before making sure I was completely satisfied as she thanked me for the party in her special way. Life went on and things got back to a normal routine except for Lisa coming home late a few nights a week due to her time at gym. I made sure to be home with the kids and have dinner ready on those nights. She came home late from her workouts. Jake had an after-school club on Thursdays and needed a ride home. Lisa agreed to pick up Jake from school on Thursdays because his school was several miles away and crossed some busy roads. Jake complained about being picked up and wanted to walk home because he said at 15 years old he didn't want his parents to pick him up. I explained that some of the roads he had to cross were too dangerous and if he wanted to be in the school club, he had to ride home with us no exceptions. Of course he agreed and I picked him up every day with Thursday being the exception due to my Thursday staff meetings and Thursday pickups became mom's routine. One week Lisa was busy at work and forgot to pick him up and after 40 minutes Jake decided to walk home. That was one of the few times anyone in the family saw me upset. Lisa was apologetic and upset with herself after seeing me lose my temper and let them both know how I felt. Lisa swore it would never happen again and after I cooled off accepted it as a mistake. No harm, no foul and all was back to normal at home. Once again she made it up to me in bed that night and life went on. Financially things were going well, work was good and the family seemed to be happy except for me. About two months later I noticed that our sex life had gone from four to five nights per week down to once or twice and it was not at the same level we used to enjoy. Lisa became more self-indulgent worrying about her looks having facials and her hair and nails done weekly. It seems that once she hit the big 40, she desperately wanted to turn back the clock. New clothes and shoes filled the closet and when I protested over the money she was spending I was greeted by an angry woman and a bitchy wife who told me coldly that I was the one getting the benefit of the new young pretty wife and that all the hard work she did to look like this was for me. I wanted to tell her that for all her efforts I was getting no satisfaction and terrible sex. I told her I missed the old Lisa but that I still loved her just as much as new Lisa. More late nights, time at the gym and a few nights out with Maria our neighbor and gym instructor. That's when I made a decision to take her away for a weekend to reconnect and try to get things back on track. I loved Lisa but needed to put my foot down and get things back to normal. The following week I planned on taking her to dinner on Friday night and telling her of the plans of our getaway over a romantic dinner. Tuesday night I told her I made reservations for Friday night and already made plans for her parents to come over and be with the kids. The next morning I watched her getting ready for work. She was wearing another new dress that was a little over the top for work along with dark pantyhose and red high heels. She looked sexy as hell but too dressed up for work. When I asked her about her outfit she explained that the big bosses were coming in and she wanted to impress them. I knew better than to start a fight so that Thursday morning I left the house wondering if I was ever getting my old Lisa back. I loved her but disliked this new woman. Perhaps it was my insecurity because I never lost my extra weight and when we were together we no longer looked like a couple. I now had a trophy wife without the love and intimacy we once shared and I was struggling and praying that our getaway weekend would help us reconnect. Unfortunately, the events of that week delayed any getaways or a date night. It was Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. when I got a call from the hospital. I was delivering a presentation at our staff meeting when the call came in that Jake was in the emergency room and needed immediate surgery. They explained I needed to get there immediately. I ran out to my car and drove like a madman to the hospital, which was about 15 minutes away. I called Lisa several times but no answer. I called her parents and asked them to pick up the girls and come to the hospital to be with her brother. I left Lisa multiple messages and texts on her phone wondering and worried about where she was. She always answered her phone but for some reason wasn't answering today. When I got to the hospital I met the doctors, signed all sorts of papers, gave my insurance card and spent a minute with my son who was unconscious and covered in blood. It looked bad as I noticed his broken leg, cuts, and bruises all over his body. I kissed his forehead and felt tears running down my face as they wheeled him to the operating room. I was alone and scared to death as I started to worry about Lisa again. 
They led me to the surgery waiting room where I met up with my daughters, along with Lisa's parents, Edward and Mary. They looked to me for answers, and I told them what I knew, including their missing daughter. We came to the conclusion that Lisa didn't pick Jacob from school, and he decided to walk home again. I told them I was really worried about Lisa because she wasn't answering the phone and didn't pick Jacob at school. They realized how unusual that was as we stood in a circle in the private waiting room trying to figure out what was going on. Let me call her office again and see if they know anything. I said as I dialed her office. I called and asked the other person for Lisa's whereabout, and I was told she hasn't been seen after she went for lunch. I said our son was in an accident and is in the hospital and that I really need to find her. So I asked the receiver if she knew when and with whom she went to lunch with. She said she left at 1 p.m. with Mr. Donnie, one of their supplier's sales reps. I then asked for his number so I could try calling him to see if he knew where she was. After waiting for a few moments, she sent his business number to me. I thanked her and told her to call me as soon as possible if she hears anything. I hung up and immediately dialed his number. There was no answer and it also went straight to voicemail and I suddenly had a very bad feeling. Not only was I distraught about my stunt who was about to have major surgery, but my wife seemed to be missing in action along with some salesmen. Tears were running down my face from all the stress. Lisa's mom, Mary, gave me a hug and told me to hang in there. I was feeling anger start to build up when I heard Jasmine yell, I found mom dad. I turned to Jasmine who was holding up her phone and asked, what do you mean? She said her mom put this Find Me application on their phones to keep track of them and it works for her phone as well. She pointed to a flashing red on her phone and said she's right there. I then asked where is that? She zoomed into the phone and after a few seconds it gave us a location. It was at a hotel somewhere downtown. When everyone heard that they turned to me with a look of surprise. I quickly had an idea of how to get in contact with her. Unfortunately if my idea worked it meant the end of my marriage. Everyone watched me hit buttons on my phone. They were wondering what I was doing as I called the hotel and asked to be put through to Mr. Donnie's room. They put me on hold and a moment later I heard the phone ringing. After eight rings a man finally answered in a frustrated tone. Apparently I was disturbing him. Hello. Hello is this Mr. Donnie? Yes. How can I help you? Can you please put Lisa on the phone? There was a short delay before he answered. Sorry there is no Lisa here. You must have the wrong number. In an assertive, controlled voice, I said, Donnie, listen carefully. I'm her husband and our son is in critical condition at the hospital. Look, I know she's there and I need to give her the details. Now please just put her on the phone. After a long silence, I spoke up in anger. Donnie, if her son dies before I get to talk to her, I will find you and kill you with my bare hands. Do you understand? Now put her on the fucking phone. I heard the phone moving and then Lisa's voice. Hello, she answered in a nervous voice. In contrast, I was firm and in control when she answered. Lisa listened carefully. Jake was hit by a car while he was walking home from school. He's in surgery and in critical condition. When you get done ducking your boyfriend, please come to the surgery waiting room at X Hospital. Do you understand? I heard her scream as I was disconnected from the call. I was so focused at that moment that I forgot that my two girls and Lisa's parents were listening to the conversation. They were now looking at me in complete shock. All the emotion from the day and hearing my wife on the phone with her lover was all my body could handle and I actually cried. For the first time ever I cried in front of my family. The pain was great from Jake's accident and the loss of my wife and I could no longer be stoic and strong. I was on my knees sobbing as my kids hugged me and cried. Maria and Roger, our neighbor, stood next to us as well. It was a sad scene but I knew everyone needed my strength so I stood up, kissed my girls, wiped my eyes, and spoke to everyone. I apologized to everyone for what they've just heard and that I lost it when I heard him answer the phone. I told them that it appears Lisa spent the afternoon in bed with some salesman from work and forgot to pick Jake up. I said she's with him right now but I'm sure she will be here shortly now that she knows what happened. I asked them to please keep her away from me because I'm not sure well do in the state I'm in. I saw the anger in her mother's eyes. Mary was one tough broad and did not raise her daughter this way. She didn't approve of her daughter's recent changes and told her so but she never would have believed her little girl could have done this. Jasmine was still crying and asked, Dad is mom cheating on you? I said it appears that she is but you can ask her when she gets here. In the meantime let's focus on praying for your brother. 
He needs all of our prayers right now. We can deal with mom later. About 20 minutes later, Lisa walked into the surgical waiting room only to be confronted by her mother. Mary walked up to her daughter and immediately slapped her across the face so hard that it would have brought down a grown man. Lisa's head practically spun around and her face was already turning red from her mother's strike. You slut we raised you better than this. This is all your fault. I hope you're happy. She spoke through her tears. Mom, it's not like that. Her dad grabbed Mary and looked at Lisa with a sad face. Lisa, stop it. We all know what you've been up to today. It's a shame that you didn't care more for your son than you do your lover. Now your son is fighting for his life because you were in the arms of another man. That's when our daughter Jasmine yelled as she cried. I hate you. You cheated on dad and now Jake might die. I hate you. I hope you die. Yet this was a fucking train wreck. Lisa looked my way but when she saw the look on my face, she turned and sat alone on one of the chairs away from the rest of us. For the next 30 minutes we sat there not knowing what was happening with Jake until a doctor came in to talk to the family. He explained about all the broken bones they were fixing and the punctured lung that was already taken care of, but the problem was some internal bleeding. He explained that Jake had lost a great deal of blood and was in grave danger. He said he would need blood and wanted to take some samples to see if we could donate. Of course we all agreed. While we waited for our blood to be drawn I looked over at Lisa and had to ask, Will we learn anything from the blood test Lisa? Is Jake my son? She started crying harder than ever with her head between her knees. She was rocking back and forth as she cried like she had never cried before. Turns out my blood was the same as Jake's and we ended up donating several pints of blood. A few minutes after we gave blood I asked everyone to give Lisa and me a few minutes alone. After they gave us our privacy I took a good look at Lisa who was trying to avoid eye contact. I noticed how disheveled her clothes were and I realized she must have rushed out of the hotel room to get there. Lisa, you look terrible. Your nylons are missing, your makeup is a mess and you haven't even brushed your hair. You smell of sex and I'm guessing you're sitting here with your family while your body is full of your boyfriend's spunk. You couldn't be more disrespectful if you tried. That comment caused her head to snap upright and speak for the first time since she arrived. He's not my boyfriend, please don't say that. There's no one else. I only love you. I responded with, Lisa, if he's not your boyfriend then do you just sleep with random guys? Are you really just a slut? Please show me some respect. I'm not an idiot. You've been turning me down for sex for the last two months. Hell, even last night you feigned a headache and turned me down again. Why Lisa? Did you want to be fresh and ready for your boyfriend today? Look, this isn't the time and place to discuss this. Just go home, clean up and come back looking presentable. Our children and your parents don't need to see you like this. I don't want to discuss your betrayal or our divorce until after Jake gets better. She immediately responded, Divorce? No. Joel, you can't divorce me. I love you. Please don't say that. I said, Lisa, we'll discuss our future, but not now. I can't waste my energy on you right now. I have my son to worry about. I need to focus on Jake, not what you've done to our family. Just go home and get cleaned up. If you can't drive, I'll have your dad take you or I'll call an Uber, but you need to leave now. Jake won't be out of surgery for a while and you should be here when he wakes up. The last thing he needs is to see you looking like this. She stood up, tears still falling, said she's so sorry and left. About two hours later, Lisa was back with no makeup, hair in a ponytail and wearing jeans and a sweater. She had stopped crying but looked terrible from the crying and humiliation. She was now sitting with her mom and dad as our girls sat by my side. I told my girls we had to stop any resentment towards their mother and that we needed to focus on Jake. I explained that there would be time to have conversations about this later, but right now, we needed to be a family. So, for the next two days, we took turns holding a vigil for Jake who remained in medically induced coma. Finally, on the third day, there was positive news from the doctors and Jake was going to be okay. He would need to stay in the hospital for a while, but he should be able to go home in about a week. We all cried and held each other when we got the good news. Lisa tried to warm up to me, but I wanted no part of that and gently pushed her away as I held my girls. Lisa's world had imploded and she had no idea how to reinsert herself into the family and save her marriage. Since the family was taking turns staying at the hospital, there was no sleeping arrangements for Lisa and I, but on the third day, 
I decided to let Lisa know how I wanted to move forward back home. I told her that now that Jake's going to recover, I'll be sleeping at home again. Obviously, I don't want her in my bed. And since she's the one taking on new lovers, I think it's only fair she moved her things into the guest room. She cried and told me not to kick her out, that she loves me. I told her that right now, until Jake fully recovers, there is no us. She is the mother of our children and will need her to help with Jake's recovery, but until I decide what my future holds, she and I are no longer a couple. Yes, we're legally still married for now, but I don't think of her as my wife any longer. The tears flowed again, but she understood and moved into the guest room. I talked to the girls and they understood. We all agreed not to let Jake know what was happening until he was healing and getting better. I turned the living room into Jake's recovery room, rented a hospital bed and wheelchair, hired a daytime nurse, and prepared for his return home. With Jake in the living room and not mobile, he wouldn't know our sleeping arrangements as long as the girls kept our secret. His recovery was our priority. As for the vehicle that hit Jake, it turns out it was a driver of a paint company. During the investigation, the police discovered that he had been vaping and was under the influence and was texting on his phone at the exact moment of the incident. The lawsuit did get a decent attention. Our attorneys knew we had a slam dunk case and sued for an extremely large amount in compensation. After the jury heard the entire story, the company knew they were in trouble and offered us a hefty settlement rather than risk an even higher punitive damage payout by the jury. This did little to assuage our anger and grief but it allowed for the best medical treatments and physical therapy for Jake. It was also enough to secure his future, pay for the kids' college, and allow me to take a hiatus from my job and be there for Jake during the 18 months it would take for him to fully recover. My wife and the girls were all involved with the recovery. After Jake's release from the hospital, we brought him home and introduced him to his new room, complete with a hospital bed, the remote to the TV along with his video games. We wanted him to feel as comfortable as possible during his rehabilitation. We had several day nurses helping us during this time, which turned out to be a blessing. Maria and Roger came over daily to help, and along with our daughters, we all got used to the new normal. Roger and I spent a great deal of time talking about things and my plans. Her parents wanted the best for the family and suggested counseling to try to stay together. Several times, I told them I wasn't ready and wanted to continue to focus on helping Jake through his difficult time. Lisa and I were only speaking when we were together with Jake. From hearing the girls talking that their mom made some type of mistake, Jake realized that there was a big problem. He was always the sensitive one in the family, and one day when we were alone, he asked me what was going on and for me to forgive her. He reminded me that mom loves me, and he can tell she's been hurting. I had to wipe a small tear away and tell him that our issues weren't his concern and to concentrate on getting better. That's the moment I realized that I needed to face the situation and make some decisions. I told Lisa we were going to dinner on Friday night to have a talk. Maria and Roger sat with the kids that Friday night. We went to our favorite Italian restaurant and after several drinks, I decided it was time for the talk and told the waiter to give us some time before we ordered. This was the first time since that fateful day I spoke directly to Lisa. Up until that night, I had only answered questions or followed along in a conversation. So, for the first time since the accident, I spoke directly to Lisa about our future together. I said, Lisa, I know it's been hard for you, and it's not fair that you're sleeping in the guest room. Since the accident, I haven't had time to think about our future, but over the last few days, I think I have a solution to end all the stress the family is feeling about our situation. I'll look for an apartment near the house, and you can move back into the master bedroom again. Once Jake is up on his feet, I'll start the divorce process. I want to wait until he's better before he knows the entire reason for our separation. I saw a tear fall from her eye. I felt like a boy who just lost his best friend as I held back a tear from my loss. All the years of love I had for this woman were ruined by one act of selfishness, and now we were both paying for her actions. She then asked if there was any way I could forgive her and let her back into my life. I responded, Lisa, I love you and probably always will. Besides Jake's accident, losing you has been the hardest thing that's ever happened to me. I just don't see a way back. Your selfish act of putting your boyfriend before our family and betraying my love is something I'm not sure I'll ever get over. Our son Jake almost died because you needed to be with Donnie. Think about that and put yourself in my position. 
She told me not to say his name, and that she's hated herself ever since that day, that she knew she messed up, and she doesn't deserve anything from me or the girls, but is there anything she can do? I told her I don't think so, and as far as I know, she hasn't done anything to resolve the situation, and that just shows she really don't care. I said once we divorce, she can go back to her boyfriend or anyone else. With her new body and looks, I'm sure she could have any man she likes. She said she deserved that, but since the accident, all she's done was try to be with Jake, and she tried not to think about what she did to me. She asked to make things right and give her another chance. I said, do what you want, Lisa. I'm not making any promises here. I'll wait a few weeks before I start looking for an apartment. But to be honest, whenever I think about the months before the accident, how you treated me, the lack of sex, and your narcissism, I have to believe that you really don't care. I was there for you during your sickness and worshipped the ground you walked on. You took all that love and tossed it away like a diaper full of crap. You've given what was once mine to another man, allowed him to use you, and God knows what you did with him. I don't know how I can get past that, Lisa. Tell me, how long were you dating Donnie before that day? She said she was never with him before, that it was only that one time, and there was never anyone else. I responded, that wasn't my question. I asked how long you were dating Donnie. Obviously, you two were making plans before that day. I'm going to guess you've been having lunches, maybe after hours drinks, special text messages, or an email or two. If I check your phone text messages or emails, will I find a relationship? You see, Lisa, giving yourself to another man is more than sex. The moment you started thinking of him, giving him your attention and intimacy, it became an affair. So, I'll ask one more time, and please be honest. Your lies or deception will not help our future. She said it started about three months before the accident, just before her 40th birthday. Said she was feeling old, but when he found out she was turning 40, he started telling her how young she looked and gave her all kinds of compliments. She knew it was wrong, but she enjoyed them and liked hearing that she was desirable to a younger man. Said she felt sexy, and he kept flirting, and then she let it get to her. She said I'm the only man she'd ever been with, and now after 20 years, she felt like a schoolgirl again. She said he kept trying to take her to dinner, and the constant flirting made her feel even more sexy. When he took her to lunch that day, he took her straight to his hotel room and said he'd order room service. It only took a few minutes before he seduced her, and she's regretted her actions every minute since. She swore it was only that one time, and she'll never do anything like that again. I responded with, Lisa, I noticed how you enjoy dancing and flirting with the young guys in your office at your birthday party. You'll remember our conversation about it, I'm sure. Well, ever since you started at the gym with Maria, you've changed. To be honest, I don't like the new Lisa and what she's become. I don't blame you for wanting to look young, have excitement in your life, or wanting more than I can give you. I just wish you would have told me instead of looking for something outside our marriage. I don't want to live with that woman and feel like I need to compete with younger guys, or that you were doing things behind my back. I've lost confidence in myself, our marriage, the trust one had in you, and our life together. That's not a good recipe for a healthy marriage. I'm not sure what you can do to fix things, or if they can ever be fixed. After saying those words, we ate in silence as we digested our conversation and went back home. Roger looked hopeful when we entered the house, but I just shook my head. I thanked him for watching the kids and went up to my bedroom alone. Maria saw Lisa's tears and knew nothing had changed. At least we tried. A month later, Lisa did surprise me when she told me she made reservations for dinner again. This time, she was in charge and started the conversation. Joel, you were right about everything. I did move on without you for the last two years and only thought of myself as I tried to get my body in shape. What I did was unforgivable and I cannot take it back or change the past. But let me tell you how I'm going to fix things. Trying to maintain her calm, she continued. I've been seeing a therapist to help me with the guilt for my actions. Every night I cry for hours thinking how I almost lost my baby boy and destroyed the man I love. My therapist has been a lifesaver and helped me understand all the pain my selfish actions have caused and how I hurt you in the worst way possible. She gave me some reasons for my poor choices. She said it was a cry out for attention or maybe a midlife crisis, but I disagreed with her and I take full responsibility for my actions. I messed up, made bad choices, 
and convinced myself I deserved to enjoy my newfound youth after working so hard to look good. At first, I only did it to get in shape, but after I lost the extra weight, I started to get lots of attention from men, and it made me feel young, sexy, and desirable, which didn't help as I turned 40 years old. I could tell she was struggling to hold it together, and I just sat quietly as she continued. What's really crazy is that I loved our life, our kids, and our marriage. I never thought of hurting or cheating on you, but that's exactly what happened. It started with innocent flirting, then you saw some of that at my birthday party, but of course I didn't listen. Then it was lunches and more flirting until I allowed myself to go and screw up my life for a meaningless afternoon of sex. I hate myself for what I did and realize now it's not who I am, and I want you to know how sorry I am for hurting you and the damage I've done to our son. You have no idea the amount of guilt and pain I live with every day. This was never about my love for you or our marriage. My actions were completely selfish. I was only thinking about myself and what I thought I deserved. What I'm telling you is not an excuse, and I don't expect you to forgive me because I broke my vows, my promise to you, and betrayed your trust and love. I will understand if you want a divorce after what I did, and I'll be sad, but you need to be happy and be with someone you can trust. In the meantime, I plan on trying to win you back. Joel, the last time we had dinner you said I hadn't done anything to save our marriage, and I told you that I was so worried about our son that I didn't know how to save us. After you pointed that out, I spent the last month trying to show you what I've done to get you back. She was in control of her emotions and spoke in a serious tone. First of all, I've turned in my resignation today and will be a stay-at-home mom. I'll nurse Jake full-time, and we can get rid of the day nurses. I told Mr. Cotter, my boss, about the affair with the supplier. You know all about his standing in the community and church, so while I was there, he called the supplier and said they would cancel their relationship if they didn't fire Donnie immediately. Apparently, our company is their largest customer and depends on our business for a good percentage of their revenue. I found out before we went out tonight that it wasn't the first complaint they had received and that Donnie was in fact terminated. After that, I went to see his wife, Patricia, and apologized for what we had done. I broke down and cried when I told her the entire story and how I was trying to fix things with you. The only man I've ever loved. She was much nicer than I would have been, but I think she realized how terrible I was feeling. Patricia tried to comfort me. She said it wasn't all my fault, as Donnie was quite the ladies' man and had a talent for seducing women, but she was stern and told me to never disrespect the man I love again. She wished me luck in getting us back together. She said it wasn't the first time this had happened, but that this was the last time. I think she was going to see a lawyer. After I left, I called Maria and told her I was giving up my gym membership. I also plan on continuing therapy. I realize that I'm a grown woman with a family that needs me. And I intend to be the best mom and wife possible if I'm given the chance again. I also gave all of my new clothes away and kept only a few things that are more suitable for women my age. The conversation became interesting as she continued. Over the last several weeks, I've read dozens of articles on affairs. I even read some stories where the wife gets a polygraph test to answer all the questions that the aggrieved husband would have. From what I've read, there are about 20 common questions that need to be answered. So last week, I made an appointment and went to an office downtown that specializes in lie detector exams. I had them ask me all of the questions I had prepared. They said the questions were unorthodox and not what they would usually ask, but agreed to my request. They said they would add them to their normal questions randomly. I gave them the list of questions I knew you had to be wondering about and answered them honestly. In a desperate voice, she said, this envelope has the answers to your questions. I want you to know that I have not opened the envelope or looked at the results. I know what's true and I'm confident these results will let you know I'm being completely truthful. I'll even volunteer to take a test every few months to prove how much I love you and that you can trust me again. I also met with an attorney and asked her to prepare a post-nuptial agreement to prove how serious I am and to try and win back your trust. The post-nuptial agreement states that if I ever get stupid again, I give up custody of the children and leave our home without support or alimony. I've read that this is common for cheaters like me. Yes. I know what I am now and what I did. I accept the title, no matter how dirty it makes me feel. I also know I need to atone for what I've done, and I'll promise to put you first always. 
You will find the post-nuptial agreement along with the polygraph test in the envelope. I sat there stunned at her actions and her revelations about what she had done. My wife understood the impact on our family and our marriage. I said, well, Lisa, I have to admit I'm surprised by your actions. It does give me something to think about, but I have one serious question. Why are you trying so hard to save this marriage? I mean, you obviously lost respect for me as your husband and were looking for something better. Now, with your looks and great body, you can have any man you want. You need to be honest and ask yourself why would you want to stay with me, an overweight middle-aged man. You've already made it clear that you wanted more than I could give you. Knowing how you felt about me, I can't understand why you want me now. I think you just feel guilty about getting caught and want forgiveness to ease that guilt. No, that's not it. I want us back because I love you. You were there when I was sick, took care of me, nursed me back to health, and never complained all those years. You've always been there for me, and I've always felt your unconditional love. I took it all for granted, and I realize now how precious that love was. There is nobody else I want, and I can't even imagine being with someone else. It's always been you, and I threw it away. And truthfully, you've always been all I needed sexually. You've always made me happy. I just took things for granted and stopped thinking about anyone else but myself, and that will never happen again. She was now sobbing uncontrollably in the restaurant, making hiccup noises from the heavy crying. We were now getting looks from the other patrons. I went to her and put my arms around her and held her as she cried into my shoulder. My heart was breaking again from all of her pain, and I wasn't sure how much more of all these emotions I could take. After she settled down, she handed me the manila envelope and told me to read the report later tonight when I was alone in bed. It definitely got my interest, and I wondered what I would learn. We got home, and just before we pulled into the driveway, she looked at me with the saddest eyes I've ever seen and said, Please don't leave us, Joel. Don't move out of our home. I'll be happy to stay in the guest room if you don't want me in your bed. I understand why you wouldn't want me there, because when I think how I would have reacted if you did what I did, well, let's just say I understand, and I'll be there as long as you want. I just want to be with you and have our family stay together again. Please don't leave us. I know you'll never forgive me, but please give me a chance to win your heart back once more. Once in my room, I took a shower, brushed my teeth, climbed in bed, and looked at the manila envelope, wondering what answers I would find inside. Would it make any difference? Did I want her back after everything that had happened? When I opened the file, I was shocked to find the amount of detail in the report from the polygraph test. I looked at all the questions and answers, all the data, and then the summary. Apparently, she did a great deal of research because all the questions I've had were now answered and in my hands. I wasn't sure I was ready, but I would soon know the truth. The questions seemed to have been jumbled and out of order so as not to allow her to know what was coming next. It was amusing as I could tell from the questions that Lisa had come up with, because a true polygraph would not ask questions this way. After reading the answers, I slept soundly that night, still not sure of my future, but somehow the answers to those questions gave me some relief. The next morning, I walked up to Lisa's room and told her we wanted to have a family meeting and asked her to join us. Lisa looked terrible. She had bags under her bloodshot eyes, obviously suffering from stress and crying. Because of the coldness from the family, her life had become a living hell. Oddly, the only person that was speaking to her and undoubtedly forgave her was Jake, her son who was suffering the most. He was the first to forgive his mom. This was our first family meeting since the incident and Lisa was nervous as she sat alone on the couch. I walked over and sat next to her and held her hand knowing this was going to be a difficult conversation. I said, I'll speak for all of us, Lisa. What you've done has damaged this family and left me with the most difficult decision in my life. You may not like what I've decided, but there's no other way that I can maintain my self-respect as a man. The kids have made their desires known and want our family to stay together. Up until last night, I didn't think there was a way to stop me from leaving you and moving into a new apartment. And after I read the polygraph report and what you've done to try and save our marriage, I was moved. You surprised me with your efforts over the last month. Lisa, to be honest, your cheating was devastating. But the real damage was the way you treated me and the family for the last six months. Then, when I learned that you mentally left us and were dating another man, 
I knew I was going to divorce you and end our marriage. On top of the pain that caused, I was enraged because your cheating was partly responsible for Jake's injuries. And that was unforgivable. After considering the situation, I believe in my heart that if this situation were reversed and I had taken a lover that caused Jake's accident, there would be no discussion and you would have already kicked me out. But for some reason, which I can't explain, I still love you. And losing you will cause me even more pain than you've already bestowed upon me. It's a real-life quagmire, but my love for you is still strong. You see, despite everyone's wishes, I cannot stay married to you knowing that you've cheated me, broken your promise to remain faithful and forsake all others. You broke our marriage contract, and if I stay married to you, then I'll be accepting that it was okay. It may sound vindictive, but I am still going through with the divorce. Well, that was all I had to say to her. She was devastated. But she understood I had already made up my mind and that my decision was final. I forgive her, but can't trust her anymore. The divorce process took a couple of months to be completed because it was uncontested. Assets were shared equally, and since the kids were all grown, custody wasn't an issue. I won't get into every detail, but it all went smoothly. I have to give her credit as she made us all know that getting our family back together was her primary goal. There were several times that Lisa came to my mind, but that was because of the love I had for her. We still keep in touch, and everyone is happy, including the children. All in all, we're all coping well, and the events of that tragic day were now in the past and never to be mentioned again. Jake made a full recovery, and because of the months of physical therapy, he developed a habit of working out. For me, I'm not seeing anyone at the moment, but very much looking forward to what the future holds. As for Donnie, he paid for the damage he caused my family and marriage. His wife kicked him out and handed him divorce papers shortly after Lisa confessed her sins to her. He ended up living in a studio apartment after he was fired. Dating girls didn't last long either when they learned about his cheating history. I found out about his struggles from his ex-wife, who thought it might help in the closure of my wife's affair. I do not know how or why she reached out to me, but I respect her gesture. I once read a quote that says, sometimes, giving someone a second chance is like giving them an extra bullet after they missed you the first time and hoping that this time the extra bullet won't be used. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel for more stories like this.